coming up. Seances, spirit photography and magic onions. Welcome to episode 8 of my nine part series, A History of Witchcraft and Magic in Europe. We have reached the 19th century. So having done an episode, episode two on ancient Rome that covered a thousand years, I've now narrowed it down to a hundred years. The ninth and final episode will be on the early part of the 20th century and will cover less than a hundred years. Uh, basically, the further forward we go in time, the shorter the period that we look at becomes. And that's primarily because there's just so much more evidence the closer you get to the present. In this video in particular, we have the invention of photography and we start to have photographic evidence for some of what we're looking at. And indeed, photography becomes part of magical practice in this period. If you're new to the series, hi, I'm Juliet. I'm a writer and an historian and a history lecturer. I specialise in religion, myth, folklore, magic and ghost stories and really anything in that general area. As we are moving into the 19th century, we are finally seeing the end of the European witch trials. They haven't quite gone away yet, but executions for witchcraft are pretty much over by this period. Probably the last person to be executed for witchcraft in Europe was Anna Schneidenwind, who was executed in what is now Germany in 1751. The last person to be sentenced to death for witchcraft in Europe was Anna Maria Schwägelin, also in what is now Germany, who was convicted and sentenced in 1775 but died in prison a few years later. Anna Goldi was accused of witchcraft but technically executed for poisoning in Switzerland in 1782. And Barbara Zdunk was executed for arson in East Prussia, what is now Poland, in 1811. Uh, but she could not be executed for witchcraft because it was no longer a crime in Prussia at the time. So although some people might list Barbara as the last person executed for witchcraft, it's quite significant that by 1811, in her country, which at that time was Prussia, witchcraft was no longer a crime. She could not be executed for witchcraft, even if people accused her of it. She was executed for arson. In other parts of Europe, while witchcraft no longer carried the death penalty, it was still a crime and it just had lesser punishments. So witchcraft trials were still happening in the 19th century, and indeed, as we'll see in the 20th century, um, but they no longer carried the death penalty. For example, in 1839, in Russian-occupied Ukraine, a 14-year-old boy began, in the court scribe's words, to present himself as a cunning man after a serious illness, and he was then put on trial for witchcraft. The scribe recorded that, The Court of Equity finds that the defendant, Pijaychuk, made self-interested false divinations, destroyed order, tempted ignorant people, and disturbed their peace of mind. For these offences, Pijaychuk should be punished by lower-level police servitors at his residence, with ten blows of the birch rod, and the local parish priest should impress upon him that he should not dare to carry out similar actions in the future under fear of a stricter application of the law. Apologies for my pronunciation, I'm afraid I don't know how to pronounce Ukrainian and you can't like quickly google a 19th century name. <laughs> In some places, now that people were no longer being executed for witchcraft, some people took the law into their own hands and there were some lynchings of suspected witches in the 19th century and indeed the 18th and 20th centuries. For example, in 1815, in Flanders, in Belgium, a woman was burned by a farmer, his wife and their daughter because they were convinced she had caused the illness of the daughter and their cattle and they were trying to make her confess. The woman died of her injuries, the daughter died of her illness, the father was condemned to death for murder and his wife was sentenced to be branded, so that did not turn out well for anybody involved. But we do see evidence for this in some places where there are plenty of people who still believe in malevolent witchcraft, who still believe that people in their community and often older women were bewitching them, were carrying out acts of malicious witchcraft. And since they could no longer prosecute them by law, on occasion they did then uh, violently attack them themselves. Some lynchings, though not all of them, also involved unwitching experts. These had more or less replaced witch finders. They were mostly men, but some women as well, offering their services as unwitching specialists or witch doctors, but not anything to do with the African practices that are often called witch doctors. Now that witchcraft was either decriminalised or the penalties severely reduced in most places, they switched to offering ways to lift a bewitchment rather than to simply find the witch. For example, Dutch newspapers in 1862 reported that an unwitching specialist called Sjord Brewers in the Netherlands 
had advised two farmers whose children were bewitched to drink a herbal brew and to jump over their pet cat three times a day. Interestingly, in addition to offering advice on how to lift bewitchments, which seems pretty magical itself, he also offered medical treatments that read very much as magical healing practices from earlier years. So even though he's offering himself as an unwitching specialist, he's clearly a magical practitioner himself. Um, he is lifting malicious bewitchments, but he's also practicing healing magic and positive magic. The newspaper reported that he prescribed for an 18-year-old girl suffering from nausea, headaches, backache and stomachache that she should have her toes rubbed with pig's blood in which a cock's head had been boiled between midnight and 1am, then she should be pushed around the house in a wheelbarrow three times by her father. The medicines should be buried and then smelt every other day before sunrise. The newspaper doesn't seem to specify whether you dig them up and then smell them or you just smell where you buried them. Two weeks later, the newspaper announced that the girl in question had given birth to a healthy baby boy. So that explains that mysterious illness. <laughs> As we can see from the examples of both the 14-year-old in Ukraine and the unwitching specialist in the Netherlands, cunning folk are clearly still around. They are declining in numbers in this period, but they are very much still present and still working, especially among the poorer and more rural population who can't afford trained doctors. Popular magic is also very much still around. The witch jar in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, which is said to contain a witch and that we saw a few episodes ago, where the note says that uh, the old woman who donated it said that if you let the witch out, there'll be a peck of trouble. This was donated by M. Murray in 1926, having been given to her by an elderly woman in 1915. So this clearly dates to the 18th or 19th century because the elderly woman has obviously had it for some time before donating it in 1915. So that one is probably an example of 19th century popular magic. I talked about it when I talked about early modern popular magic because it's a concept that has been around for a very long time, but this particular one was clearly in use in the 19th century. Also in the Pitt Rivers Museum is an onion wrapped in paper which is held in place by pins. This was discovered along with three others by anthropologist E.B. Tyler in 1872 and it was shoved up a pub chimney. The pub was the Barley Mow in Rockwell Green in Somerset in England. The name Joseph Hoyland Fox was written on the paper attached to one of the onions. Fox was a cousin of Tyler's wife, Anna Fox, later Tyler. The Fox family were Quakers and therefore they were opposed to alcoholic drink and to pubs. The Barley Mow had opened in 1870 when its landlord Samuel Porter applied for a licence under the newly introduced Wine and Beer House Act 1869. Porter's first application was turned down on the grounds that improper characters assembled at the pub, with the further suspicion that girls of bad character were using the two houses close by, but his two applications for 1870 and 71 went through without a problem. Joseph Fox had wanted to buy the place or to stop the licence being granted. And in 1869, he set up a temperance hall in Rockwell Green with a coffee room visited by 20 to 30 people each evening. Meanwhile, the landlord Samuel Porter was a seventh son and therefore suspected to have magical powers and even be a wizard of some kind. This is an old bit of English folklore, which you may be familiar with the Discworld version if you've read Terry Pratchett's books, uh, but that's the real life version is that seventh sons are thought to have um, powers potentially of some kind. So what seems to have happened is that Samuel Porter, whether he believed in that folklore himself or somebody on his behalf, has written Joseph Fox's name on the paper and shoved these onions up the chimney either to protect the pub from Fox trying to close it down or as an attack on Fox. Many of the divinatory practices that had been part of popular magic for millennia were starting to become stigmatised as fortune telling associated with the lower classes, associated with less education, and in some cases associated with the Roma people who have been uh, the victims of a heck of a lot of racism across Europe and still are to this day. And of course in some parts of Europe these things were still illegal under witchcraft laws including Britain. Of course astrology was still around, that one was still reasonably respectable, and other practices Practices did gain popularity despite some of the stigma attached to them. One example is cartomancy, divination by cards, using packs of cards. In the Victorian era they usually used regular packs of playing cards rather than tarot cards, which would more often be used for this these days. You could use a handbook like Louisa Lawford's The Fortune Teller or Peeps into Futurity, published in London in 1861, which taught you how to read the cards and what each one meant if you pulled it at a certain time. Palmistry, the reading of palms, was also popular. Thank <laughs> you. 
People had very different views of palmistry. Some people saw it as a fraud perpetuated by beggars. Some people saw it as a parlour game for young ladies, so with no real power or meaning, but just a frivolous entertainment. Spiritualists saw it as an ancient science. So very, very different viewpoints, depending on just who you are, your education, and what you think of the world. And several of these practices, like palmistry, became associated with games for young ladies. There were also a few crystal balls around still. The Countess of Blessington bought a crystal ball from an Egyptian magician, which she could never get any use of herself. But when it was sold after her death, an army officer gave it to his young daughter to play with, and according to an 1859 article in the Bristol Times and Mirror, the little girl suddenly cried out, Papa, there is a lady in the ball! It is dear Mama." Uh, the article doesn't specify, but presumably her mother had sadly passed away. So there's a lot of these practices that are not being taken terribly seriously by most people, except spiritualists, and we'll come to them, um, but are either being used as kind of light-hearted games, or are being looked down on where they are being used by um, poorer and working class people and rural people. The 19th century also saw the rise of popular magicians. In this case, magicians as in people performing magic tricks rather than people kind of seriously claiming to perform magic. Performers of magic tricks have been around for centuries, especially at fairs and at festivals. But it was in the 19th century that modern stage magic developed based on the idea of tricks and illusions to make something look like magic. One of the pioneers of modern stage magic was Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin, a clockmaker who made mechanical automata that appeared to move as if they were alive, and who opened a magic theatre in Paris in 1845. When Hungarian-American Erik Weiss became a professional magician and escape artist in 1891, he created a stage name for himself in honour of Houdin, Harry Houdini. Some magicians, like British William Marriott, who was active around the early 20th century, often worked to debunk the claims of others, especially mediums. They often wanted to be recognised for their scientific and technical skills, so many of them were not trying to make anybody believe there was actual magic involved. Some were, obviously people vary, um, but a lot of them were openly using science and technology to look like magic, and that became very popular. Moving into the more learned side of magic, if we're thinking in those early modern terms of learned and folk magic, some 19th century organisations were founded around or incorporated magical practices. The Rosicrucians and the Freemasons had both been around since the early modern period. They were quite popular in the 19th century. Rosicrucians in particular were interested in alchemy, astrology, the works of John Dee, and the Jewish mystical tradition Kabbalah. Freemasons in general did not incorporate so much magic as a whole, but it depends on the particular branch, the particular order of Freemasonry. Nowadays, Freemasonry in the UK is much more of a social club with some rituals attached, but in the 19th century, the more esoteric and ritualistic aspects were still uh, more popular and considered more important. In 1887, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn was set up by three Freemasons with similarities to the Rosicrucians in structure and some beliefs. There was initiation into three orders of increasingly secret and powerful knowledge, and the third tier of knowledge allowed for communication with the secret chiefs, who were spirits who were supposed to wield great power within the universe. Their philosophy was partly based on the Jewish mystical tradition of Kabbalah, but also involved knowledge of astrology, alchemy, tarot, and geomancy. Their foundational texts were the cipher manuscripts, a compendium collection of magical knowledge and theory, and a series of initiation rituals. Geomancy is divination from the earth, so it's divination using uh, the landscape and the geography and soil and so on. In another branch of Freemasonry, in the late 18th century, Italian Count Alessandro di Cagliostro, a learned magician of the early modern type who was interested in psychic healing, alchemy and scrying, among other things, had founded the Egyptian art of Freemasonry. It's not actually very Egyptian. The Rosetta Stone had not yet been decoded, almost nobody could read hieroglyphics, and knowledge of actual ancient Egyptian history was uh, slim to none. So its relationship with actual Egyptian history is... You know, tenuous at best, um, but he claimed to have got it from uh, Egyptians and Egyptian wisdom. The ritual itself has been preserved in a manuscript discovered in France by a Scottish Freemason called Charles Morrison and donated to the Museum of the Grand Lodge of Scotland on his death. It incorporates early modern angel magic and astrology. Cagliostro was arrested by the Inquisition for trying to found a Masonic lodge in Rome in 1789, and he was condemned to death, but he died in prison. In the 19th century, three rites of Freemasonry inspired by Cagliostro's Egyptian rite were founded. The first two was the Rite of Mizraim, founded in 1813 in France by Charles Le Changeur, François Joly, and three brothers called Bedaride, 
and the Rite of Memphis, founded in 1838, also in France, by Jacques-Étienne Marconi de Negre. These first two were then unified under Giuseppe Garibaldi as the ancient and primitive Rite of Memphis Mizraim in 1881. But probably the best known bit of Victorian magical practice must be spiritualism, and particularly seances. Spiritualism is actually an import from America. In the mid-19th century, ocean liners were built that could transport passengers regularly across the Atlantic, allowing increased contact between America and Europe, especially between Britain and America, because the most widely spoken language in both Britain and the United States is English. Very much not the only language in either country, but the most widely spoken one. But American ideas influenced all the rest of Europe as well, and vice versa. The first regular passenger and cargo service across the Atlantic Ocean from Liverpool to Boston was run by Cunard Line's RMS Britannia from 1840. So from that point on we have huge amounts of influence between America and Europe, especially Western Europe and America. And this meant that movements that originated in America, like spiritualism and spirit photography, also became popular in Europe. In 1847, John and Margaret Fox and their family moved into a house in Hydesville, New York, that had a reputation for mysterious rapping sounds heard at night. In March 1848, according to a later account by leading British spiritualist Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and yes, that Arthur Conan Doyle who wrote Sherlock Holmes, in 1848, young Kate Fox challenged the unseen power to repeat the snaps of her fingers. The child's challenge, though given with flippant words, was instantly answered. Every snap was echoed by a knock. So Catherine, or Kate, and her sister Margareta developed a system of communication with the spirit based on getting it to knock in answer to questions. And of course this is the source of the famous, you know, knock once for yes, twice for no, or whichever way around. In the process they established that the spirit was the ghost of a murdered peddler who had been buried in the cellar. As far as I know, nobody was ever found in the cellar. A bundle of bones were found in the wall of the cellar of the house in 1904, but they were chicken and animal bones. Interestingly, that could be a magical practice we saw in the early modern period, in the medieval period, people would have these bundles of magical items, often including animal bones, that they would bundle up and put in walls and up chimneys, uh, like the onions up the chimney as well. So that actually probably was some kind of magical practice that had led to these animal bones being bundled up in the wall. Um, but nobody has found the, the body of a murdered peddler yet. But this was the origin of the seance. And seances are basically a modernised, gentrified form of necromancy. Necromancy is one of the oldest forms of magic. In the ancient world, necromancy is often something you see in fiction more so than in real life, where you can have these elaborate necromantic rituals and call up corpses to make prophecies and all sorts of things. Of course, when it came to real life ancient magical practices, this was more in the realm of religion, where you could visit an oracle of the dead and there you could deliberately summon, call up the spirit of a dead loved one or a dead person and ask them questions. And then various necromantic practices, whether that involves trying to raise bodies or much more often call up the spirit or ghost or soul of somebody who's died, carry on throughout the centuries. Perhaps what's new about seances is just how respectable they can be. Spiritualism was a reasonably respectable thing. As we've seen, one of the most famous spiritualists was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who was knighted and who wrote Sherlock Holmes, was incredibly famous. Um, this was something carried out by the middle and upper classes, something that uh, an awful lot of people took part in. Seances themselves are, of course, still alive and well today. So they're a form of necromancy that has really taken off in the Victorian period and then became extremely popular for a while, much more so than most other forms of necromancy over the years. They became hugely popular across the US and Western Europe in the 19th century, of course primarily because of the hope they offered to grieving families who had lost their loved ones, that they could talk to them again. And of course the other thing about seances is the way they developed following the Fox sisters, who became very famous mediums, their methods were very easy to fake. So this is another reason for their popularity. Um, if you've got stories about witches bodily raising corpses who then speak, that's harder. Not impossible to fake, but harder. Um, the methods and the phenomena associated with spiritualist seances tended to be things that were quite easy to fake. And that is, of course, then part of the reason for their popularity as well, that mediums could produce quite spectacular effects. They could convince people of the reality of what was going on quite easily. 
using relatively straightforward techniques. Techniques used and phenomena reported in 19th century seances included rappings or knockings, most famously, and you can question the spirit by asking them to knock once, yes, twice, for no, or whichever way around. Table tilting, where you can ask the spirit to tilt the table in particular directions in answer to questions. Trance speech or channeled speech, this is where the medium would go into a trance and then a spirit would speak through them. Often mediums would have a particular spirit guide, which might be somebody they knew or could be a total stranger, a, a ghost who just attached themselves to the medium. And sometimes the trance speech, the channeled speech, would be the spirit guide talking through them, or it could be the person's deceased loved one. Related to that, automatic writing or automatic art, where they would be taken over by a spirit and they would write whatever came to them or draw whatever came to them. Um, it's another form of channeling. In the 1870s, we started getting materialization and materialization seances became popular. These are seances where the medium doesn't just channel the spirits of the dead, but actually help them materialize physically in the room. Attendees at materialization seances reported seeing genuine spectral human forms appearing in the room with them. And it's obvious why these became popular. They are harder to fake, uh, they are more convincing, and of course people want to see their dead loved ones. Then ectoplasm became a more commonly reported phenomenon later, after materialization seances started to take off. This was partly as a result of increased pressure on mediums to produce some kind of physical manifestation of the spirits to prove what they said was happening. Ectoplasm was a gooey or filmy substance that would appear mysteriously, in some cases oozing from the medium's nose or mouth. Again, fairly easy to fake. Spirit photography, which we'll look at in more detail in a minute, um, could also be connected with seances. Partially materialized spirits might not be visible to the naked eye, but could be captured by a camera and then shown to people afterwards. And then more minor things like unexplained breezes, flickering lights and candle flames, strange smells, Visions, ghostly orbs, and musical instruments suddenly playing themselves could all be reported at seances. This photo of a seance, I have to confess, is from America and is undated, so it might be late 19th or early 20th century, but I just had to include it because it's um, such a great photo. Um, in this seance, the medium has just had their coat removed by an unseen force. And I mentioned spirit photography along with seances. Photography was, of course, a 19th century invention. The first photograph was taken in 1827. Here it is. It is the view from the window at Le Croix. Uh, it's a bit blurry. <laughs> Daguerreotype photography was invented in 1839. Handheld cameras appeared in 1879 and film roll with Kodak cameras in 1889. Spirit photography was another American import. In 1862, a Boston jewellery engraver and amateur photographer called William Mumler set up his camera to take a self-portrait. He was standing with one hand resting on the back of an empty chair. When he developed the photo, he could see the misty form of a girl seated in the chair with one arm resting in her lap and the other on the table. Her upper body was relatively solid, but her lower body was more translucent, and she looked like Mumler's cousin who had been dead for 12 years. So said Mumler anyway. Mumler showed it to spiritualists and spirit photography was born. But of course, this is another thing that was very easy to fake because all you have to do is a double exposure and you've got a spirit photograph. Mumler became a very popular spirit photographer, and he even took a photo of Mary Todd Lincoln with her late husband, Abraham, standing over her shoulder. He was later taken to court for fraud, and P.T. Barnum testified against him. And if P.T. Barnum is testifying against you for fraud, you must be quite bad. Uh, but he was found not guilty. And his wife also worked in a similar area. She was a healing medium. Unsurprisingly, a lot of spirit photography was eventually unmasked as fraudulent. It was so easy to do, and most people didn't understand photography. So now we know, quite straightforwardly, a double exposure will look like a ghost. Um, when I was young in the 1980s, we were still using film cameras in the 80s and 90s, and you could still occasionally get ghost-like images across your photos, uh, and it would just be somebody running across or something. But people in the 19th century didn't know enough about photography to know that. So they could be very convincing while also being very easy to fake. This one, for example, is a spirit photograph taken by French photographer Edouard Isidore Bouguet, uh, who lived 1840 to 1901. He was arrested in Paris in 1875 for fraud and made a full confession. Not all of them were deliberate fakes or not necessarily deliberate fakes because of course double exposure can happen by accident. This photo was taken of the library in Combermere Abbey in Cheshire in England in 1891 by a woman called Sybil Corbett. In it you can see the faint outline of a man's head, collar and right arm. 
and this was believed to be the ghost of Lord Combermere who had recently died and who was being buried at the time the photo was taken. But because the exposure was for an hour, skeptics believed that somebody, possibly a servant, had walked into the room and paused, causing the ghostly outline. Uh, which does, of course, seem very likely. <laughs> now, if Sybil Corbett was an amateur photographer, she might not even have realised that. Uh, the fact that it happened to be being taken at the time Lord Combermere was being buried also then lends to the idea that it's his ghost that's appearing, uh, but it could equally be a footman or the butler. That was a bit of a whistle-stop tour of 19th century magic. I feel like we've barely scratched the surface, but there's so much that to go into detail on any of it would make this whole thing hours long. <laughs> we will pick up several of these topics again in our final video in this series, which will be on 20th century magic, particularly in the earlier part of the 20th century. So look for that in four weeks' time. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like, subscribe to my channel for myth, folklore, legend, ghost stories, and weird and wonderful history in general. And until next time, bye! Goodest girl. Goodest and bestest. I'm gonna show off your little bandana to everybody. There you go. That's a good girl, there you go. High five! High five! Good girl! Good girl. Good girl. Well done, Freya. <laughs>